Welcome, everybody. I'm really happy to have you all here. I think other people will be drifting in, which is fine. Um, but let me start on my introduction just um, to get us going. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome you to our iEar Presents event, uh, BioArt Visionary at CBIS. I am Kathy High, and along with my colleague, arts professor Brand Miller, we co-program the arts department series, I Ear Presents. This is a series that's had a long, long, multi-decade history within our department. And, and uh, so we're happy to continue it here. These bioart talks are also sponsored by RPI's Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, or CBIS, the arts department, the School for Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, and finally, the Sanctuary for Independent Media's Nature Lab Initiative. I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are indigenous peoples of the lands of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We honor this community, past and present and are committed to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. These bioart talks have been a series of online presentations given by internationally recognized bioartists. Bioartists work with biological materials and use biotechnology to produce their artwork, critically looking at the materiality of biosystems and the processes used in scientific research. The series has been generously supported by funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, by approval of the New York State Legislature and the governor. We are grateful for the support. Today's um, speaker, um, I'm very happy to welcome Miriam Simone and her work looks at the intersection of ecology, technology and the body, spanning multiple formats, including video performance, installation, writing and communal sensorial experiences. Trained as a sociologist, Simone spends time in communities of experts, ranging from biomedical engineers to breastfeeding mothers, taking on the role of artist as field worker. Much of the process is rooted in research and lived experience, forefronting corporeal and sensorial ways of listening, learning, and knowing. Of chief concern to her is the collision of bodies, human and non, with rapidly evolving techno ecosystems. If collision can be understood to be a form of disturbance in the ecological sense, then in disturbance, we move through damage to an opportunity for renewal. Simone's centers, of, centers the sensorial as imperative for this renewal. Simone's work has been presented internationally, including Gropius Ba in Berlin, New, the New Museum in New York, Himalayas Museum in Shanghai, the Contemporary in Baltimore, and the Bogota Museum of Modern Art in Bogota, and has been supported by Creative Capital and the Robert Rauschenberg, Joan Mitchell, and Onassis Foundations. Miriam's talk today is called Corporeal Entanglements All the Way Down. I love that title. Um, and in her own words, works with sensorial corporeal experiences as sites of multi-species, multi-epistemological assembly. And she questions the role of politics, bioart, alongside biotechnology and bioengineering in this work. Please join me in welcoming Miriam Simone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Um, Thank you, Kathy, for the invitation. Um, yeah, I guess without further delay, I will share my screen and um, begin. Um, I also just want to say um, it's all a communal shared experience, including the Zoom talk. So if you have burning questions, um, well, we're on Zoom, so it's harder to do that. But if you have burning questions as I go and there's a way to get my attention, um, please feel free. 
So everybody can see everything well, right? It looks great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Super. Thank you for, yeah. Um, corporeal entanglements all the way down. So this image is um, from the synchronized swimmers that I worked with in a, in a more or less recent work I made called Your Urge to Breathe is a Lie in 2019. Um, and I just really love, this was a position that they figured out through play um, as we were figuring out how to train the future of the human based on the model of the cephalopod. Um, and it was really fun working with these girls um, and basically asking them to forget all of the discipline that they learn as synchronized swimmers and not come up above the waterline, which is where every, all synchronized swimming is judged only from the waterline up, meaning what's in the air, and just play underwater. Um, and really amazing things came out, including this position, um, which I think just illustrates um, visually kind of the way I, I understand the world to, to function in terms of um, bodies colliding. So yeah, I work at sites of collision um, and really thinking about where, where human bodies and non-human bodies collide also with each other but also with rapidly evolving techno ecosystems. And by definition, like these techno ecosystems are wrapped up in political economies. Um, and with some recent work I've been doing that has also been coming more and more to the forefront of the, of the work itself. Um, so my proposal for you today is that biotechnology is one such collision point. Um, it's kind of an obvious statement, but really thinking about biotechnology as this collision, right? Um, how does it begin to unpack what biotechnology is and how it functions um, within different landscapes? So I just Googled what biotechnology means really quickly for myself um, a couple of days ago, just trying to like get a sense of what the hive mind Google says. And of course, uh, and you all know probably better than me that uh, a lot of it is about medicalization. There's like a lot of the word genes in there. Um, uh, a lot of it is around products, not surprising, but kind of strange still um, that some definitions define it solely as products. But there was some allusion to processes. Um, and of course, like working with biology, working with living systems. And this is really my proposal um, today is that this, which is an ancient practice, um, is also a form of biotechnology. Um, and that whereas this is kind of one way to go underneath the water, this is another way to go underneath the water. And that this, just as this is a technology, and most of us would agree, it has these steampunk aesthetics. This is 1907, um, humans figuring out how to be in a difficult environment deep under the sea. This is another uh, way to do the very same thing and also requiring, um, if not an object, a set of practices. So this image for me um, was really foundational in, in a big body of work, transhumanist cephalopod evolution uh, that the synchronized swimmers were also a part of. But also I would say transform my thinking entirely in my practice and in my life. Um, Right, so this image, when we look at it, let's say according to certain um, dominant Western, but not only Western kind of discourses, uh, one person here represents the future and one the past. But in fact, if we remove that frame for a second, what you see is two people um, deep in the sea. So both like in extreme environments that let's say our biological system is, can is obviously capable of being in, but it's not the easiest uh, for us, or maybe not the most natural, if we dare to use that word. Um, but they're actually just two represent like two different strategies to being a human in an extreme environment. And both have their benefits and their drawbacks. Um, and so I really, yeah, started really thinking about how we decide 
but what are the processes or what are the tools by which we um, kind of move forward and do difficult or amazing or just things that we're curious about? And also kind of, again, what are the political economies that situate the decision to follow one route or another? Um, so that's just a framing that I wanted to give you to think about the work that I'm going to show you now, but also a discussion I would love to have after about really thinking about how we think about biotechnology. Um, so this is the first, a very early work I made, and let's say like um, the first, one of the first forays into biotechnology in a, maybe in a more traditional sense. Um, so this is a, an original human cheese pictured in front of its urban pasture where the milk was collected. Um, cheese made from human milk uh, with the aid, of course, of bacteria, different bacteria and different cheeses to, uh, to give it more flavor. I'm just going to play- My daughter's two and a half and my son is eight months old. A little bit of this. This is making human cheese. It's available online. You can find it. I have a pretty, uh, I eat most everything. I eat a fair amount of meat. I like a lot of vegetables. I'm not a huge fan of fruit. I love pasta, because I used to cook pasta in a restaurant, so I eat a lot of pasta. And I love cheese. That's my favorite thing. What's your favorite kind of cheese? Gorgonzola. So cheese is, of course, um, the kind of, I mean, I was interested in playing with cheese because cheese is kind of the first biotechnology in that it's milk transformed by bacteria. And then we begin as humans to use different bacteria on purpose to create different flavors. Um, uh, and I was interested kind of in how we at this time uh, guide or allow or or disallow certain technologies in particular biotechnologies to develop. And I was Looking at that point, there was a lot of news around kind of renting surrogate um, bodies. And there was a controversy over it, but more or less it was allowed. And let's say now almost IVF is not, not even, I think, considered controversial. And I was interested in how, um, yeah, how you can rent a womb for nine months and this begins to be normalized. But yet um, making cheese, which is, let's say, the very old biotechnology from human milk was st is still considered such a huge taboo. My daughter's um, And then other things that came up. So it was really important for me actually to make this cheese. And this is something that comes up again and again in every project that I do. That like, uh, while it's one thing to have an intellectual exercise, or even a visual artistic exercise of what this means. It's an, another thing entirely that happens when you have to go through the process and you begin to really understand all of the knots and webs that you become implicated in, in doing, in, in actually doing the thing. So one of the things that I had to do was, and some cheesemakers, you know, hate me forever for this, but was sterilize the milk. Um, because in fact, uh, of course, human milk can pass human pathogens to people. So I, while I did ask for blood tests um, from the mothers I worked with, you know, just to, just to be safe, I was still sterilizing the milk. But one of the other things that actually get passed through human milk is uh, industrial pollutants. And in fact, human milk is one of the places like where the pollutants get expressed out of the body the first and the fastest, because it's kind of one of the fastest ways to like pollutants get end up getting stored in fat and human milk is, you know, lactating is a very direct way of, of expressing fat out of the body. And so of course this, these pollutants are getting passed um, to children every day, but uh, kind of the question then was, do we maybe think more about the health of um, the bodies of our neighbors if we are in fact consuming food that, that they are making with their bodies? Um, and so this is one of the presentations of human cheese. It was, this was at NYU where the lawyers told me I was only allowed to present the cheese if it had a, class, a, a glass or plastic uh, cover on top so that nobody would be tempted to eat it a, a little bit and that NYU would be liable, which I found really interesting. Um, but also there's this life cycle human cheese platter 
And there you see the diagram on the right, which is kind of this life cycle analysis of making human cheese. At that point, I was living in Brooklyn and taking the L train. So this was the transport that was being used. And you see these three lines that feed into these three circles, which represent the food, water, and air quality um, that, of course, like transportation or production affect those. And then those go back into the mother's body and back into her milk, and so then back into the cheese. Um, and really crucially, it was super important for me that this, just as I made the cheese, it was very important for me that um, people were kind of faced with the decision of whether or not to eat the cheese um, and kind of had to deal with it, with everything that the smell and the seeing it and then maybe the tasting it or not tasting it uh, required. And I found it really interesting that it worked both ways, that sometimes people say, oh, yeah, of course I want to try it. And then when the time came, they didn't want to, or they said they couldn't. And also the opposite, where people were kind of had many, many thoughts and ideas and were very against it and said they never would. And then when it was there in front of them, they were quite tempted and did. Um, and this kind of, I don't want to say disconnect, but this space between um, our, ling I wouldn't even say rational, but like our linguistic or our abstract or our, um, yeah, brain and what happens when our body begins to tell us things is continues to be a really important moment um, in across my practice in all of my work. But yeah, and beyond beyond tasting it, it was quite important for me to start a conversation. So I had these comment cards that people answered. Um, and on one of the comment cards, like, it, I mean, it's a very open comment card, how was it and what's next, which allowed for me like a quite interesting diversity of responses. And one of the comment cards wrote this last thing you can maybe read, mass production, triple question mark, human farming, triple question mark. And I loved this comment. And so when later I was invited onto this Canadian news show, this live news show to talk about um, the selling of human cheese, not really as an artist, more as a proprietor of the Lady Cheese Shop, which I opened in New York in 2011. They, you know, they were asking me what this whole thing was about. And I was answering as an artist, probably with too many words. And eventually the, the producer broke down and said, listen, I, I don't know what to do with all this. What do you want it to say on the bottom of the screen as you're talking? And I borrowed from this uh, anonymous commenter, human farming. So, Ghost Food 2013, I kind of continued work, was interested in continuing working with food. I'm gonna go really quickly over some things so we can get to the more current stuff, but I'm happy to talk about any of this in the questions. But basically Ghost Food was a food truck that served um, simulated flavor experiences of foods uh, threatened by climate change. And so the way you eat it is um, you wear this kind of heads up wearable display, um, that was designed to fit in with the line of Apple products and it holds the artificial scent of the threatened food to your nose while you eat an edible textural substitute. So what does that mean? In the case of peanut butter, which is one of the foods we were serving, you smell peanut butter and you eat this kind of soy butter that has a similar texture, but not any of the flavor. Um, and it gives you, because of the way uh, olfaction works within plate, within taste, it gives you the sensory experience of eating peanut butter to varying degrees. So in the US, we did uh, chocolate peanut butter and, and fried cod, and they really worked to varying degrees, which also like this disconnect was really fruitful, interesting process. Um, then I was invited to kind of make a similar, or I was actually invited to do ghost food but for this show called New York City culture makers biennial, um, but I became really interested in using this experience to talk about not a kind of food that might be threatened in the future, but something that is actually quite threatened now. So this is how I found out about the Agalina secuta, which is the only federally protected endangered plant species growing in New York state. Um, it's tiny, as you can see, this is it on my finger, this image, it's like super illegal to do this. Um, uh, it grows, it blooms just one day a year. Most of the other day, all of the other days in the year, it just looks more or less like a piece of grass. Um, and I became slowly obsessed with this, with this flower. 
and I, you know, I had committed <laughs> actually already um, to to making the scent experience, and it was only a few months in that all of the different um, land managers and botanists and biologists that work with this flower said, well, you know, it doesn't really smell. And in fact, it does smell, but its scent is imperceptible to humans in the wild just because it's so small and it releases so few volatile chemicals that we can't register a scent. But I worked with the uh, IFF, this uh, fragrance and flavor, international fragrance and flavors company to use mass spectrometry to capture. So we captured the chemical compounds in the, with using this glass orb um, for around an hour and then took it back to the lab and did a readout and kind of I see it really as a translation of taking those elements and the frequency at which they appear and turning it into a perfume. Um, the perfume is called Our Day Will Come and then there's this kind of ritual performance that I created um, with the help of of performers where um, you would wear the Adoro, which is, as you can see, uh, another version of, of the piece that was used in ghost food. And it would hold the scent of the Agalinus acuta to your nose. <clears throat> but in fact, the Agalinus acuta is a hemiparasite. So its roots attach to the roots of a neighboring grass, um, little blue stem grass in the wild. That's actually one of the reasons why it's endangered why when they tried to propagate it, it's like nearly impossible. Um, and so I was struck that uh, we've created the scent of the flower, but in fact, if you were in the wild smelling it, you would never smell it in isolation because it needs this grass to survive. Um, so the way the performance or the experience went is um, they're drinking vodka and the vodka is infused with little blue stem grass. And because alcohol actually kills your sense of smell, there's this really interesting time-based sensorial experience that happens where you put on the Adoro, you smell the Agalina Secuta, then you take a sip of the drink. It kind of kills your sense of smell and overpowers and all you can do is taste with your, um, with your taste buds, but also like with the receptors that are in your throat. So you taste um, just the flavor of the grass and let's say the vodka too. Um, and then as the sense of smell slowly comes back, you find a third scent, which is the combination of these two flavors. And then of course the flavor of the drink dissipates and you're left again only with the smell. And for me, this was uh, this nice uh, moment that kind of mirrors the fact that this flower blooms literally one one morning a year. So when I was making, so I made a three channel um, video installation and when I was making the film and needing to film the flower and also just for the project, I really wanted to see it bloom. It was really this like elusive um, impossibility that when you catch it, it just becomes so special. And so some of that was recreated uh, with the flavor experience. So then I was invited to show this work in many different places, including in Shanghai. And I think it's when um, the curator sent me this image of the news making a little piece about the show and she's wearing the device and smelling the fly that it really hit me that this plant that they can't get to propagate. And there was one instance that they told me about um, the Nature Conservancy that they found it growing on private land and um, 10 feet away was public land. And so they just wanted to move it 10 feet because then it would make it much easier for them to protect it. But they couldn't get it to propagate 10 feet away from where it was currently growing. And so it struck me that here, you know, you can't get it to move 10 feet, but I'm bringing it half halfway around the world. Um, and this really kind of stuck with me and it turned into this other project or, uh, called wet, A Wet Chemical Trace, which um, which says that if you accept my proposal that the scent of the Agalina Secuta is some instantiation of this being, um, what happens now that it's been extracted from its vegetal body and kind of can move through the world and through bodies um, with the forces of, you know, whether it's the humidifiers I'm using, so it's water vapor, but also kind of my desire as an artist or this global flavor company or the art world and the mechanisms at play um, that are now kind of 
transporting the, the, the flower through the world instead of, you know, seeds being moved by wind. So this is uh, the installation of a wet chemical trace at the Momento Biennial in Montreal a few years ago. Um, the grasses that you see is the little blue stem grass. So the I was kind of interested in inverting the parasitic relationship. So here, this, all the sculptures include grow lights and they include um, the scented water vapor. So the, the plants are actually growing from the sculptures, they're kind of dependent on the sculptures. And so the sculptures are kind of, let's say maybe in a, in a future, which is not that far away, unfortunately for this particular species where the vegetal version of it doesn't exist, maybe maybe this is the Aglanus acuta garden. Um, and there was also a video also called Wet, Wet Chemical Trace that has some text that's a bit my imagination kind of speaking from this being that used to be this tiny little flower and now um, is, a, is a, a wet chemical trace moving through the world. Um, there's some of this video. So this video is also online um, and I'm gonna just with time speed through a few things here. So um, survival trilogy part one, I'm currently working on part three. So I'm just gonna introduce this work. I do not have to kill in order to survive. Um, this is the installation of the exhibition. Um, so uh, I did this food justice residency in the Santa Fe Art Institute in 2015. And when I arrived there, there was a little sign on the door that had a picture of a gun with kind of the line through it, like no guns, which I had only seen with like no barefoot or no smoking before. And I was quite struck that this was what was happening in the place I was living. And, um, and I was also interested in food justice. Uh, you know, most of the other works were looking at kind of food justice for humans. And I was started thinking about what about justice to, to those that we eat? So I learned, I decided to learn to hunt with guns um, and uh, skin and cook uh, an animal. Um, these are some works. Um, and let's say one of the things that happened there was, um, you know, I needed somebody to teach me how to, hunt, uh, which was a, a long process of finding someone I felt comfortable with to going out to the desert um, with giant guns. Um, but of course, the person that I found this amazing, amazing person named John had really different politics to me, um, but super generous and, and wonderful. And, and we, you know, things got complicated, let's say, even with my own politics. For example, I, I figured out that shooting guns is very exhilarating, which is, I think maybe only makes it more problematic. But kind of doing the thing, yeah, changes everything. So these are a series of, of works I made with, with body parts. And then I made this film, Imagine Lines and Alibis. Um, in the end, so this is me shooting an AR-15 because John said that you have to kill something big like a pig or otherwise it doesn't count. Um, but we couldn't find any pigs. And in the end, we found two, two hairs that I prepared. Um, so this is the film also online. Um, but here we get to, to a more, much more recent work, Interspecies Robot Sex, which is kind of the second part in survival trilogy. So if the first part is dealing with um, kind of uh, me, got, like the technology of guns and this kind of mythology of the American West and the lone hunter and 
um, eating other species through this predator prey, I don't know, maybe LARPing reenactment or maybe real process, depending on how you look at it. Interspecies robot sex looks at kind of what happens to interspecies relationships and the technologies um, being deployed when you scale up to a globalized industrial food system. Um, so I'm going to play just a little bit of the film. So the, the, this film is actually has four channels of sound, I mean, three channels of sound, um, which unfortunately I have no way to relate to here, but one of the channels of sound is um, embedded in the seating by a transducers. So it kind of it actually vibrates um, and vibrates through your bones. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with Lisa Schoenberg on who recorded the beautiful B sounds um, and created created uh, some of the sound design for the this third tactile vibrational channel of sound. Um, and so the film moves between two sites. Uh, I, I should say that there's no bees anywhere in the film. So the only representation of bees is in this third channel of sound that you feel with your body. Um, but the film moves between two sites, kind of two responses to colony collapse disorder. Uh, so one is the humans doing the pollination work of bees uh, in two different sites in China, and the other is at the RoboBee Lab at Harvard University, um, where they're building these um, tiny little drone bees. Uh, that are ostensibly, that are talked about for artificial pollination, but let's say um, it's largely funded by the military and um, are, ve are very expensive pollinators, we can say that. Um, but it's also kind of interesting that here the, the word drone, of course, comes from the male bee that moves around uh, w without thinking too much. And I, I really love that the metaphor here is folding back in on itself. Um, in addition to the film, so this is, the film is actually on view now at the List Center at this group show called Symbionts, um, which is, maybe you know about it, we're all about artists working with biological materials. But it was really important to me for this film um, that the film, even though it has three channels of sound and is really in conversation with your body. Um, it was missing some of the really intense experience I had um, while filming, which was, you know, I was raised in a city. I didn't spend a lot of time on farms, but as soon as I got out of the car in this largest fruit orchard in the world, so it's just like flowers and flowers and flowers as far as you can see, you're hit with this kind of fish metallic stink. And even though I didn't know it was pesticides, my body knew. So I just became really interested in this and really wanting to, to add the olfactory and add the, again, the bodily knowledge um, into the work. And so the, the window work that you see there um, is called the sound of a, artificial, of a bumblebee refusing to colonize an artificial nest. And it's all, um, beeswax and honey and dried fruits and dried flowers in this um, separate piece, uh, which is called the sound of a hive giving birth. It's actually the dried flowers and pollen from China that I collected and honey from China, but also from Cambridge, kind of representing the robo bee. And then on the, on the window work, um, it's different flowers and fruits that grow in New England where the show is located that require cross-pollination. So let's say it's like a whole bunch of materials um, that, that can't really exist without cross-pollination. Uh, this is an installation shot of the film and the, the famous bench. This is Lisa recording bees on the rooftop in, in New York City for um, for inclusion in the bench. And I'm just now actually, as I'm looking at these images, realizing that there's a visual connection also to these speaker, uh, to the wires in the hive and then the, the speakers in the bench. Um, and I just wanted to add this. I, I gave a lecture in Caroline Jones' 
class uh, last night and she shared with me this response from her student um, about experiencing the third channel of sound that I found quite amazing. So as a vessel receiving the vibrations and harnessing them with the unexpected desire to subsequently emit my own sounds, I realize that I am becoming an instrument myself, like the Aeolian harp that is more than just a vibrating object, but a model for the vibrating subject itself. As the harp's vibrations generate a multitude of feelings, the possibility of imagining oneself to be a harp emerges as a response to the conceptual understanding of vibration as a form of energy and life force in one's own sensitive self. Yeah, I'm just going to leave that there. But I, I do love, I'm not sure it was, um, it was definitely not consciously intended, but I do love the idea of thinking about the audience as an instrument um, to be played within the work. So this body of work um, is quite big and was quite transformational for me. Um, Transhumanist subtle thought evolution. Uh, basically, it was my proposal for what transhumanism should look like amidst the reality of climate change and sea level rise. Again, this image, um, also thinking about so this was like really thinking about technology as a training and not as an expensive uh, device. So both the philosophy of kind of a, a process rather than an, a product, but also let's say thinking about issues of equity that come with who gets to be a future human. Thinking also about model species, what a model species means in science and what a role model species could be. This is the first time I super, uh, with super awareness in both of us, really communicated with a cephalopod. Uh, this is the Pacific striped octopus uh, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, so transhumanist cephalopod evolution is a training process for humans to develop the sensitivities and capacities that cephalopods have. And in particular, we focus on three intelligences um, embodied intelligence, shape-shifting intelligence, which I define as the hyper-awareness of your hyper-local environment, and then the ability to shift and respond your identity to be most resilient in that environment, and then distributed intelligence. So, of course, um, cephalopods have a completely different uh, nervous system. So, like, the idea, even the first thing that you learn uh, in the human nervous system that you have the central nervous system and the peripheral that that just even that already doesn't apply to them and within octopuses in particular you hear this thing that oh maybe octopus has nine brains and that's one way to think about it but perhaps also another way to think about it is the octopus can have nine different um like it's nine animals housed within a single skin because they they actually do have like enough separate ganglia in different parts and sometimes one arm doesn't know what the other is doing or doesn't agree. Um, so this is one of the exercises, is a tongue mirroring exercise. So it has a couple different functions. One is to just practice what it's like to be an invertebrate because this is one of our only invertebrate organs. And the other is mirroring. So maybe you've done this game where you kind of mirror with your hands and if you do it long enough and are attentive enough, maybe you lose sense of who's guiding and who's following, which is a bit my proposal that this is the state of kind of distributed intelligence where you have multiple inputs and processing points, but it's not, there's no hierarchy of, of where the central brain is. Um, yeah, some stills from the from the films, I made a film, Your Urge to Breathe is a Lie. This is a training I did with MIT engineers at MIT, where we, this is us then practicing um, embodied tactile intelligence, learning where you are through touch. Um, this is a cosmology diagram, a kind of mapping the world <laughs> in which transhumanist evolution lives. Uh, and then central to this work is actually doing workshops. So I've been doing workshops for a couple of years now. Um, and I did the first one underwater, the first public workshop underwater this summer, which was super fun. Um, this is the image from it. Yeah, where we, we actually do the, the trainings. 
Uh, and then there's always a training manual. So every time the video is shown, the posters get given away for free and they're the exercises and like very simple, uh, you know, kind of Ikea inspired drawings of how to, how to do the exercises. Uh, and the film, which is also available um, online. Um, but moving ahead, contact zone. So this is um, a working title to the third part of survival trilogy um, that's looking at rewilding. And the project is, um, yeah, I love this. I really started thinking about the zone as like the rewilded zone and thinking a little bit about stalker. Um, and so there's two different um, sites at which the rewilding is that I'm looking at. So one is the introduction of Eurasian links from Eastern Europe to um, to the Swiss mountains. Um, so I'm just going to ask this person to, to I'm gonna play the, a little bit of your Eurasian breathing. of the film um, just to say that in the process of creating the training training process um, I worked with three different groups of people so I worked with this choreographer Luciana Achugar who is really amazing and we the program was kind of both inspired and developed in collaboration with her um, and so I worked with dancers but also with MIT engineering and science students and then finally with the synchronized swimmers to kind of find different ways that all of these people are in their body but also thinking about what the future of the human means to find those exercises that i that i showed and yeah the synchronized swimmers are um in some ways the most advanced version of the future human both because of their ability to be in water but also their ability to work together um without the use of language or almost without the use of language because of course they're underwater most of the time um, but back to contact zone. So there's two different sites of rewilding that I'm looking at. The first is the, re the introduction of links from Eastern Europe into the Swiss Alps uh, with the idea that the links as the top predator will kind of manage the ecosystem to produce all these changes so that we can have the desired ecosystem that we want. Um, and then the second site um, is my gut. Um, so I, through drinking water kefir, which is, comes from these grains that are produced by a Mexican opontunia cactus that then in turn, when they're fed sugar, produce all kinds of different bacteria. This one is um, one of the Helgardi groups. Kind of thinking about, so if in Switzerland, we, that's a macroecology of taking these cats and bringing them there to transform, begin to transform everything. What happens in the micro on the micro scale of my own microbiome. Um, so this research with the microbiome, I'm just in the beginning stages, but uh, I spent last winter in Switzerland and did a lot of work around the Eurasian links. So this is the current known territory of the Eurasian links. Um, I, I love that it's huge, like super, super vast. Um, but of course there's, there's different subspecies. And so crucially, the Eurasian lynx in Switzerland were brought from Eastern Europe, um, from the Carpathian Mountains, which is the oldest old growth forest in Europe, um, currently undergoing a huge deforestation. And so one of the things that I play with a lot is this idea of kind of here and there, um, the zone as being this place where here and there overlap, where here and there interpenetrate each other. And so 
while we can we it's right like re, rewilding is talked about as like we're bringing back the original species that used to be here and on some level that's true there were links in switzerland until the humans killed them all of course probably a different subspecies than are brought from eastern from the carpathian mountains in another way to think about it in some ways we are like either supplanting or just kind of mixing around all of these places by bringing the carpathian links to manage the swiss forest which then affects the cascade of animals and life forms that are and soil and water quality that are happening there and at the same time um let's say uh western style neoliberal economic developments is being brought to eastern europe in particular to uh where the carpathian is which is a lot largely romania um and new eu very new eu um country that has to kind of sign up to different uh, policies in order to join the EU and in the process, and I'm not saying that's the only reason, but let's say in, in all of these processes is undergoing its own changes, which is then affecting the ecosystem, which is making it in some ways look more like Switzerland did 60 years ago, which started them on this whole process of needing to rewild in the first place. So I just find it really interesting the way these things are happening. Um, this is a map, this is very Swiss, this is a map of Switzerland uh, and they do these every few years counts of different species and so this and they actually make this grid of the country and put camera traps in each of the like cover enough camera traps in each of the grids so that they can make this count of which grid is growing and which declining in in whatever species they're looking at. Um, this is Mila, who is the mother of the Eurasian lynx that I ended up focusing on because uh, B178 is, is, she's the mother of B178 because B178 territory was very near to where I was living. And it's interesting, so Mila gets a name because she is a mother cat that gets a GPS collar. So the GPS collared cats get names, the ones that don't get collared remain numbers. She was a very productive, um, as I was told by uh, one of the ecologists that works for CORA, the Carnivore uh, Ecological Wildlife Organization in Switzerland, a very productive rewilder because she had 17 links that they know about. But of course, at the same time, one of the biggest problems that they're facing because they only introduced 34 and now they have around 200 um, is genetic, a lack of genetic diversity and beginning to see inbreeding and some health issues due, due to inbreeding. So it's this, she's very productive, but in, in some ways, but in other ways, maybe not so great for the health of the entire species. Um, so this image was taken with a camera trap. I became quite obsessed with camera trap images because in fact, it's like nearly impossible to see a lynx. Um, I went on a walk with one person that works for Cora, that's worked for Cora for 30 something years and he said that by the, like this by chance without any technology um without any device technology or like radio telemetry i've only encountered a lynx twice in my life but at the same time you know you have this right like <laughs> the country is gridded and covered in cameras um and these really cryptic animals that are nearly impossible to spot without the help of some other eyes or devices we have just like thousands and thousands and thousands of images of them by now. And I spent a lot of time looking at these images and also thinking about what these images mean as a form of managing the wildlife, or if you want, you can use the word relating to instead of managing. Um, so this is uh, where the camera chap was kind of born. Um, this is, uh, it's escaping me now and I don't have my notes, a, a, a American photographer, uh, in 1907 or 1909, he borrowed a technique from the Ojibwa uh, people in Michigan, like on the lakes, where it's called jack lighting. Um, so they would hunt like this, right? They would they would have a fire in the front of the canoe, and in the back, in the shadow, would be sitting somebody, and with the fire, they would both catch the attention of the animal and. Uh, put light on it and from the back the per the person could kill the animal and so he um 
who was a very avid hunter and then became a, quite an avid ecologist because of course the hunters were some of the first people to notice that there was not much being left to hunt. Um, he invented this way of, of photographing the animals and actually spoke about how photographing them was a way to satiate his thirst for the hunts in the off season. So I, I became really interested in this relationship between um, hunting to kill or, or shooting to kill or shooting to photograph. Um, yeah, and what all this means for the way we relate to this wild or rewild. This is just some, I also got quite obsessed with all the glitches in the camera trap. So for lynx in particular, they put cameras on both sides of the trail um, because they want to see the spots because based on the spots, they can identify the individual cats. But of course, sometimes there's a glitch and the one camera takes a picture of the other camera flashing. So these are some photo transfers I was um, working with. And just now, literally these, these years, um, 2020 was the first year they used machine learning to look through all the images just to identify the humans so they could throw away those images. Um, but they're just now beginning to build the AI model that can actually look through the links images and identify individual links um, for them. And here you can see a paper that's about how the AI sees the cat and sees the spots. And I became also very um, interested in, in this and like the, the distance and the abstraction, but also, um, yeah, different forms of relating. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in is there's some talk around developing um, an artificially intelligent agent that can kind of act on the world in terms of ecological management. So similar to a self-diving car that it's kind of uh, if we use the metaphors that are popular, it sees the world, then it parses that information, then it acts upon that information to create a similar ecological management tool that can sense a landscape, uh, decipher what's happening, and then in fact automate certain actions in order to modify the landscape. So but really, the, this rewild is really some hybrid of uh, you know, a biotechnology of introducing a, a species into a landscape in order to initiate other changes, but then also the technologies that are, the kind of hard technologies that are being deployed to watch and observe and parse through all the patterns that, that we're getting from the data that's beginning to pile up that's kind of more than humans can parse and kind of what these ecologies uh, are turning into is something I'm super fascinated by. And again, borrowing um, from stalkers, the zone, so, and of course, at the same time, you know, very close to the mountains where the, the links were brought to in Switzerland, you have human migrants, right? So cats, the rewilded animals, they talk about translocated animals, right? They've been um, forcibly <laughs> forced to migrate, you can say. Um, and the human migrants that are crossing really, this is in Italy, um, quite close to Switzerland, and uh, people are crossing, trying to cross into France um, in the very same mountains. And so just really thinking about um, borders and like going back to, again to this map. Um, yeah, really thinking about borders and who belongs where and what are the stories that are told around who belongs where um, and where biology, like everything on the spectrum from biology to nationalism, uh, like how all these stories get tangled up and told became, became really, really interesting to me. And, and also has me at this place of really asking the question of maybe this idea of ecological management about preferred ecological state that we're talking about, um, which is better than what ecological management has been to date, which was actually about returning an ecology to a specific point in time, like 1979, we're returning this park to how, what the species composition was in 1979. So now it's, this notion has been abandoned in favor of understanding that that's impossible, like a preferred ecological ecosystem balance, but perhaps actually it's about multi-species justice, right? Like what does justice look like um, rather than a specific uh, ecological state. 
Um, so just to finish up quickly, um, for now, this work exists as a performance and a text, uh, a walk. It was the first performance was done as a walk through the territory of where B178 um, was known to inhabit. And it's not clear actually if B178 is dead or not. He hasn't been seen in a while, but neither was his body found. Um, and it's really framed around kind of a walk through the rewilded zone with four different sections of um, the known known, the known unknown, the unknown known, um, borrowing those three from Rumsfeld, but also this um, proposed category, sorry, the unknown unknown is his, and then the, this proposed category of the uh, unknown known, right? Like things that we know, but we, unknown for various for various reasons or choose not to know. Um, but I'm developing also this performance now here at Onassis to be done uh, not in the forest. Um, and one of the things that I that my proposal is in terms of both knowing and unknowing um, and kind of the limits of the limits of this, like dealing with the limits of this, uh, if you do uh, understand, when I say this, I mean like either AI or this kind of um, the gridded map. If you do understand the zone to be a very complex series of maps and the zone to be a space that's kind of, right, so in the stalker's zone, it, he's throwing that nut because, to, because the zone is changing all the time. So it can't actually be charted from this God's eye, satellite's eye, drone's eye view. It has to be charted topologically and also in the very particular moment. So one of the things, we go through a series of different sensory ways of being and knowing or maybe unknowing in the forest. Um, so many of those are kind of practices that I've developed that come out of the transhumanist cephalopod evolution work that I've been doing now for several years, including seeing without naming, which is a practice developed by Luciana Atugar, the choreographer I worked with, which is all about uh, a very short description, kind of using your eyes to feel what you're looking at inside your own body. Um, but also I became quite interested in attention deconcentration, which is a technique um, created, which is a technique I learned about because there's a very famous Russian free diver that uses this technique um, but it was developed actually by a, a Soviet extreme psychologist um, as a part of a whole host of practices called psychonetics, um, which were designed, one of the reasons they were designed was um, to train Soviet spies to become resistant to what the Americans were developed, what the CIA was developing um, as mind control weaponry, also known as kind of all the psychedelic research. Um, and I find it really interesting because actually when you start doing these practices, it's also a form of tripping, but of course like without the use of substances and rather with this very hard mental work. But attention deconcentration is in a really quick summary, the idea is with your mind, you can concentrate your attention on, on one specific thing, but you can only do that for a pretty short period of time before you get tired. And with attention deconcentration, you are attending to the entire field of experience. So this, so you can start with vision. So for example, instead of looking at different points that are visible in your vision, you attend to the entire field that is available to your eyes um, without moving your eyes kind of, and, and through doing this, it's a kind of relaxation or a deconcentration, but by staying very attentive, you can, for example, begin to, to notice when something is moving much faster than you would if you were trying to find it. And then this, this practice is, is uh, absorbed or is moved to all kinds of different other sensory experiences like sound and tactile and so forth. Um, and I think with that, um, Oh, I guess there's one project that I would just like to mention quickly that's still very much in progress, um, but it's called Scope of Work. And I was really pleased and, and grateful that Kathy High uh, 
participated and talked to me a little bit about it because for now it's actually still very much in the kind of information gathering field. Um, but it's really a project that comes out of this question, can artists affect material reality? Um, so one of the people that participated in transhumanist cephalopod evolution, one of the engineers I worked with um, was an MIT student and then went on to, he discovered as part of his PhD, um, a way to possibly sequence proteins and went on to start this startup called Glyphic Bio. Um, and he invited me at first, he was thinking about like, if he wants an artist in residence, um, but I was a part of this group of people that was really thinking about artists as consultants. And so together we're still trying to answer this question. Um, and the idea was, what would a scope of work look like um, for them to hire me as a consultant to make an artistic project, which um, is both kind of valid, whatever that means, uh, as an artistic project, but at the same time, because they're paying me as a consultant and not just like a little artist in residence that gets, not little, but as an artist in residence that let's say often happens sits under the communications department that has a, has to have a real, in their language, value add to the company. And so um, we're still, we still didn't develop the scope there in another round of funding. So they're quite focused on that. And once they uh, hopefully are successful with the second round of funding, we're gonna continue. But I did go to San Francisco for a week and hang out with all of the different people that are employed there and just begin to ask questions about what art can do and what how knowledge is made um, and, and created this telegram channel with many, and then spoke with many people, Kathy High being one of them about these questions, people that have been thinking and working within um, bio, biotech research spaces and with the arts um, and also with people that work with consultancies and created this telegram channel with audio notes and text messages. And it was somewhat a com successfully a, a conversation with a group of people um, around this work and, and the next thing that will come will be actually like a scope of work contract, um, hopefully for them to hire me. Um, so with that, I will um, end the presentation and um, I just wanted to show one thing that is just so crazy. So this is... Uh, This is actually Alexei Machinov, which is the son of this very famous Russian freediver Natalia Machinov. Um, and they're the people that use attention deconcentration. We're not we're not seeing the if, if there's an image, we're not seeing it. found out about it. Um, yeah, we're not we're not seeing the image. We're just hearing. Yeah, the, hearing just the thinking audio. about kind of training and practices, and working within existing bioavailabilities, and just like the, like this person still, they just took a breath in the beginning, though, and they're still going. Miriam, we're not seeing the image, we're just hearing it. Also, I guess just to say that once you're this deep in the water, the pressure is pretty phenomenal. So your entire body is contracts, like your heart becomes much, 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 your lungs become uh, your sorry, your lungs become much, 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 much smaller than they currently are. Um, the amount of air that you can fit into your body is much, much smaller. And then once you get to 126 meters, you have, you have to go back up.
Okay, and I'll leave it there. We, uh, you can go on YouTube if you want to watch him go back up. Thank you, Miriam. I, uh, we didn't actually get to see the last thing you were showing us, but we, we did hear it. So oh, no. it sounded, oh, but we heard, your we heard your descriptions too. So it was quite amazing. I don't know if you just want to put up a little bit of it so we can see it. Yes. Or we should just, okay. that'd be great. Sorry. Thank uh, you. Um, uh, I just closed it, but let's see. Um, Yeah, or you can send us the link, but here we go. This is great. So one of the most amazing things about the freediving community is how supportive the competitors are of each other. If you are able to see this, all of the freedivers... Great, thank you. That was really, that was great. Now it, now that makes much more sense. <laughs> thank you though, that was an amazing, amazing, amazing talk and it's so cool and mind blowing to hear all of the ways you're thinking about these different projects. Um, so thank you. Everybody put, put uh, comments in the chat if you have any or, or questions and also please feel free to raise your hand and um, Sina help me look for people who are raising their hands. Um, I. There's so many things I want to ask about. Um, one of the things that I find so incredible about a lot of the works is the ways that you're thinking about scale. Like it's like you're often thinking about things that are large and small absolutely at the same time. You know, like like with the last one of the last projects you were talking about the survival trilogy where you're thinking about the links and that territory and that kind of multi-species view of it, but also then your own gut bi biome, you know, and how that's kind of inner, how that could mirror maybe some of this rewilding um, practices. And so, you know, I, I, I just, as a practitioner and, and thinker and artist involved in all these things, I'm just curious, like when you start working with the, your projects, is there one that comes before the other? Is there one you know, are you are you drawn to the larger scales first, and then you, or are they all just kind of like coexisting and coming kind of into some, you know, as you said, like deconcentration, you know, view at the same time? I mean, and this is maybe something it's impossible to answer, but I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah. Um... I think I don't. I just. The thing I'm most drawn to are connections, almost. Mm -hmm. So it's very rarely, like the shiny object, whatever, the cat, whatever you want, is there and it glimmers and you come to it, but then it's like all the web that it sits in is the yeah. part that I get really drawn into, which is where it does start to move across scale, right? Yeah, yeah I guess. But also I'll just say, because I'm a big proponent of this and it's the way I make it through every work. And, you know, I, I read, like I quite have a research-based process. I read a lot. I was trained as a reader, writer, research, like talk to people a lot, go out into the field, which is already getting somewhere. But at some point I really stop all of that and I just go do something. With, like I go shoot guns or dive deep in the water. Um, and it's, Inev I mean, I should, maybe I, I like knocking on wood, but inevitably it's always through that process, you know, once you've done the research that you understand what the work is for me, where I understand. But um, yeah, so I, I, there's like something almost some magic, almost sacred thing that happens in the, in the embodied uh, relation that then like does transverse scale because it becomes experience, right? In this way. Right, right. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, oh, Ali, do you want to, I see a question here. 
from Allie. Do you want to, Allie Wist, would you like to join us and ask your question or would you like me to read it? I think I can with that. We're just having We're just feedback issues. Uh, cool. So maybe there we go. I'll, okay. uh, you got it. Okay. Great. Yeah, I Thank guess um, my question is sort of an ambiguous one, but um, in the bees film, it's so striking that there aren't any actual bees in it. And, you know, it's just the human pollinators and the robot bees, which maybe aren't even used for pollination. But there's a lot of, I feel like, absence across your work that I hadn't noticed before um, with the various endangered foods and the flower. And I guess I'm just curious what your interest is in absence, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question um, that I will think about a, a lot in the future. Um, but for now, I guess, so with the bees, I can speak to that because I, I have thought about that a lot. Um, I was really, so I was drawn to colony collapse disorder because it's kind of this systemic um, problem, like a lot of ecological, a lot of problems that come up because of ecological issues, even though let's say the, the driver is a systemic problem, you can find something that's causing this symptom and you can kind of solve that. And then let's say it's solved. And with colony collapse disorder, it's just like, it's industrialized agriculture, it's like monoculture, it's maybe cell phones, it's, it's just a host of different issues. And so to really kind of solve the problem, you really have to stop industrialized agriculture, which nobody is planning to do. Um, so that was what drew me to the problem. But then I just became really interested in actually maybe less the colony collapse itself, but more in what are, what is our, like if we're not planning to stop industrialized agriculture, what is our plan moving forward? Um, so the film I, I think is really, is not about bees, but is very much about their absence and about their supplantation, like these two different ways that we've found to supplant what, um, what their absence means. And so then I think like in the process of editing, it became more and more apparent that it was really important that they, I mean, I'm not gonna say they have a voice, that's too much, but let's say that you are reminded actually of, of what this is all, why this is all happening and what it's all for. Um, yeah, and then, I don't know, I guess um, things that, but yeah, things that go missing, just like more broadly, I guess things that go missing are, I'm drawn to things that go missing. Thank you. I, and thanks for that question. It was really fantastic. I think yeah. one of the things that's so beautiful about the work is this way that you do bring attention to loss in a way that, and, and then kind of also in that, in that piece, particularly, like, I'm really curious how the robotic drone even works. I mean, I have, I've read about this, but I've never figured out, like, how would they really think they're going to get this thing to work? So, you know, in, and I don't know if your piece is actually dealing with this, because um, I haven't seen it in person, but it, it points to the sort of absurdity of these propositions like that, um, which allows, to me, it, it allows me to begin to think about, about these issues um, very concretely. And 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 um, and mourn that loss at the same time of sort of figuring out like okay this is probably not going to be fixed um, because of this other technology. More of a comment, not a question, but thanks. Yeah, <laughs> the bees. I mean, they well, I guess define work, right? But they yeah. Why? Um, for a long time, they had they needed a wire because there was no battery that was small enough to power mm -hmm. them. Um, now they've figured out how to get it to fly for like under 10 seconds with a very big solar uh, panel attached. Um, the idea is that they're like eventually swarm, intelligent swarm talking to each other. Uh, that part is not working, but interestingly, um, so this is the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering and kind of one of the innovations of the group is that they really, work with insect biologists to really understand the shape of the wing and how the shape of the wing enables certain fluid dynamics. And so it's really kind of mining 
evolutionary design to construct robots, um, mm -hmm. which I actually found to be, I mean, yeah, in the way, in a way, I think the film actually became about extraction and just like these other forms of extraction that are happening with natural systems. Because also in China, the interesting thing is that as the economy develops, like it's becoming a little bit economically untenable to pay people to do the work of bees. And so all these, um, you know, pear producing towns that have, some of them are kind of famous for Buddha ate their pear because they've been producing pears for thousands of years, are turning to tourism and like, kind of selling the idea that you can now take pictures with the pear flowers, which is again, this like transition from a energetic caloric maybe extraction to a representational one, which is super interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Brandon, I see Brandon Miller has a question. Which should I, can I turn it over to you, Branda? Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you and hello. That was super inspiring. And I'm, um, you know, especially intrigued by um, uh, the breadth of, uh, of your artistic practice, the different places you can investigate. It's, it's like um, so incredibly open and fluid. And I'm wondering what the connection is with vibrations and what how do you... You talked about vibrational um, material, there's vibrations in embodied practice. How does vibration guide you in your artistic practice? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> I guess, yeah, like vibration also in the word vibe, no? Um, I follow vibes pretty, um, pretty often in terms of like instinct, but maybe I'm kind of a believer that like some of instinct is actually coming through vibrations. Um, whether it's like, yeah, anyways, we don't have to get into that. But um, yeah, again, I think it's like something about the, well, I think you see, maybe you see that the, I keep coming back to these places that are beyond the rational or even the linguistic or even maybe the visual and finding some kind of knowing in, in that space beyond that opens up entire worlds or understandings of what's happening and how I can relate to it. And I feel like that is like, it's in the vibrational that, that stuff. And I think like with the cephalopod work, I mean, I really transformed my own sensitivity to all kinds of vibrations in ways that, um, yeah, that are, that changed everything. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a very it's open question. That answer. Um, I think it's part of your intuitive process. Is yeah. like a, a a muscle for connecting your vibrations to the ecology surrounding you. That kind of guides your process. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, everything is vibrating. <laughs> vibrating like that is the the connection. That is often the connection, the connection points. Thank you, Branda. And um, I see a, a question from, or a comment from Alessandra. Do you want to um, say that yourself, speak out? Yeah, I can. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there's an interesting connection between the, the absence of the bees in the, the bee piece and the, the like, idea of training ourselves to live underwater with the cephalopod piece, cephalopod piece like it's biotechnology and that we're training ourselves how to to live underwater not buying equipment as a product so I think it's interesting that you're kind of imagining this world that we're kind of destined to be in 
just by the nature of like our culture and like a capitalistic kind of way but though it seems kind of negative but you're kind of looking at it as like how can we survive so I think there's an interesting connection between those two pieces thank you yeah Um, I wonder if you could, I know that you're in Greece right now in Athens at the Onassis Foundation residency space. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about the, the work you're engaged with there um, and, and you know how that's going. Yeah. Um, so a lot of actually what I've been doing is like further training myself and others, like just not training others, but collectively we're learning how to train this attention deconcentration stuff, um, which is wild and, and difficult. But then I've been, I've been kind of looking at like where bacteria and water intersect in a couple of different places in Greece. Um, I'm really in the very, very beginning stages, but a couple of the, the, the nice connection points that are happening here is, um, one is in Zakynthos, where it's an island kind of uh, closer to Italy or in the Ionian Sea, um, where I think 15 years ago, they just like snorkelers discovered this place. And then it was named the lost um, archaeological site, the like hidden ancient Greek city, because there were all these columns and kind of circular formations in the ground. And, and then about 10 years later, somebody went, um, the scientists went and, and took some samples and understood that there's actually some vents, um, like what we think about as deep sea vents, but this was quite shallow near the, near the coast. Um, and the bacteria that are living off of the vents, their byproduct is calcium and they're growing these structures in, in these calcium orbs. Um, yeah, and I just became interested in in you know the 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 group responsible for like in Greece for ancient discoveries, which of course is very important here. Uh, went and investigated, and then when it was understood it was bacteria, it was kind of not not deemed a heritage site for protection. Um, so I'm kind of interested in all of that, but also just like the capacity of of bacteria to build things that look like things that we think are, are treasures and whether or not they still are. Um, another, another place I'm looking at is there's a, a biotechnology lab here at the University of Athens that's looking at this indigenous form of bacteria that grows on the Lohi mountain, which is a ski resort mountain uh, in the north of Greece um, that has certain properties that seems to make it um, able to crystallize water into ice uh, at, at higher temperatures than kind of normally is it would happen without this bacteria and now they're thinking about like can this be commercialized for artificial snow creation um, so yeah quite quite interested in in that and then one of the things that I attended while I was here is an extremophiles conference that was happening happening here in in Greece um, where yeah all kinds of wild people studying mostly bacteria that live very deep in the ocean or in very cold places or in very hot places um, uh, presented their research so I'm still like in the beginning of feeling of feeling things out but a lot of it is also about you know quite wide disparate um, forms of research and how to bring them together I think for the first time I'm interested in not building the narrative myself which I generally do or like find my way through but rather try to use this attention deconcentration method to let the narrative or not the narrative like let the connections that might be there emerge instead of me creating it myself so one of the things Ali Akbakhtar in the person who started this that now it's like a life school because he also similar to the scientific researchers that were paid by the CIA to study psychedelics kind of found meaning through this technology that was hope the state hoped to use for weaponry purposes 
um, in a very similar way, he figured out that this technology allowed him to find true meaning by which he means um, it's like a way to throw off the shackles of your ideological frame um, because, and you know, like it's up for interpretation what that means, but as far as I can understand through my own practice is that you're, when all of you is so invested in sensing through, like I said, visual, auditory, proprioception, like sense, both ex, like your body, what's happening externally and internally, you know, smell, you can add to it. Um, and doing it in this relaxed way, the things that come, maybe it's not so fast that you can apply all your ideological filters to understanding what's happening. And I, I guess I just got really interested in what would happen if I applied that to my research as a method. Thank you, that's a wonderful summary. We've got one more question, which I think we'll close out with. Um, KS, do you wanna join in and, and ask this question yourself? Hi, um, yeah, sure. So you. you actually just touched on this. And so, you know, I realize we're short on time. Maybe it could be quick um, or whatever, but, I was curious to hear more about how you think about perception in your work, because um, it sounds like so many of these projects have to do with expanding perception beyond what we normally think of as the senses in various ways. And I was wondering in particular how that comes across, like you were kind of just saying, um, there's sort of like the theoretical or the research component of that, but then there's also how it comes across in your choice of mediums or like what the work is going to be like. I was thinking about the choice of using transducers for the B piece, you know, to have that vibration and also, you know, that tactility and sound um, or a choice to do interactive performance, you know, um, how are you thinking about, yeah, those, those, the perception of the actual work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... I work in probably too, too many me mediums. Um, but I think for me, it really comes, like it just comes out of the research of what makes sense. Um, I, yeah, I sometimes struggle with that because you know, there's like a certain mastery that comes when you use the same medium again. And that seems like it would be nice to have, um, but it's, yeah, it's about sharing some discovery I had usually along the way. And then that is has to be shared in whatever way it has to be shared. Um, yeah. But thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, for that question. Thanks, KS. And thanks everybody for your questions and especially to Miriam. Thank you so much. This was such a rich talk that I think we're all going to be chewing on it for a really long time. And it's just, um, it's such a pleasure to hear you talk about your work. I, I really thank you for taking this time and joining us. And I hope that you'll come back sometime. I hope you all will. So let's all join hands and thank Miriam Simone for that wonderful afternoon. Anything. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for you. having me.